This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. An unknown killer stalks a family in Denver, Colorado. In 1985, Roger Dean was gunned down in cold blood in his own house. Five years later, the killer contacted Dean's widow and threatened to kill her daughter unless he was paid extortion money. December 7, 1941, the Japanese sneak attack devastates Pearl Harbor. Nearly 40 years later, a woman under hypnosis provided a detailed first-hand account of that infamous day, which occurred a full 10 years before she was born. In Las Vegas, an eccentric, beautiful con artist named Liza Montgomery went on a wild two-day Christmas shopping spree and gobbled up $150,000 worth of jewelry, furs, and other luxury items. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. December 7, 1941, 7.38 a.m., Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. For those who were there and survived, it was indeed a day that will live in infamy. Their memories are as vivid today as they were 50 years ago. just heard was related by a woman under hypnosis. She was born in 1952, 11 years after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The woman claims no more than a passing knowledge of the events of that fateful Sunday morning. Yet much of her account is filled with specific names and details which lead some to believe that she was actually present during the attack in a past life. Others, however, are convinced that her memories are no more than a byproduct of hypnotic suggestion. In either case, the details of the story defy logical explanation. The woman at the center of this baffling mystery of the mind is asked to remain anonymous. We shall call her Sharon Johnson. Step like this one, if you would, please. In 1979, Sharon Johnson first visited hypnotherapist Frank Baranowski because she wanted help losing weight. In 20 years of practice, Baranowski has placed thousands of patients under hypnosis. Ever been hypnotized before? No. Do you know what When Sharon was hypnotized, she began to experience a recurring nightmare of smoke and fire which had plagued her since childhood. Three, four. You're four years old now, Sharon. Water's on fire. The water's burning. All right, Sharon, all right, all right, relax, relax, deeper, relax now. I don't have dreams Deep like that as much as I used to, you know, just periodically. Uh, the dreams started when I was very small. I always remember having the dreams about fires and explosions. Sharon lost 30 pounds, but the dream remained unexplained. Six months later, she visited Hawaii for the first time on a group tour with Frank Baranowski and some of his friends. 
It was strange when I was there because there were places that I, I went to when I was there that it was like, I've been here before, I've seen this, I knew where things were that I couldn't have known about. Sharon's visit to the Battleship Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor triggered the same anxiety as her recurring nightmare. She returned to her hotel room and asked Frank to hypnotize her. During this session, Sharon began to speak as never before, and a new persona emerged. His name was John Gillespie. OK, so we take her to the time machine. She's uh, Sharon Johnson. We go back to age 12, age 10, age 5, down to birth. And then I, I ask her to start recalling something that happened. I said, when I reach the count of 12, you'll be in the 12th season of your life. OK, and suddenly when she's there, uh, she's talking like a 12-year-old. What's your name? John. John Gillespie. I'm a junior. Oh, where are you at? On the farm. What farm? I says, where are you at? She says, what? This is Omaha. Omaha? Yeah. Well, Omaha, Nebraska. As the session continued, a chilling account of the surprise Japanese attack began to emerge. <coughs> bombs dropping everywhere. They're everywhere. These planes have weathered bombers with it. <laughs> <coughs> In the account, several men were named who were on board the Nevada at the time of the attack. Among them, a Captain Scannon, a Paymaster Cooper, and an Ensign Tossick. Don't worry about me. Take them forward. Take them forward. Don't steal the main guns. They're going to be back. In Sharon's memory, Tossick was particularly prominent. He was apparently the son of an admiral and was badly injured. A few minutes later, the story came to an abrupt end. With great pain, Sharon realized that John Gillespie had been killed. Very good. Deeper relax for me. Up to that point, I had not had a past life regression. I wanted to know more about what had happened and, and who the person was that I felt I was in this traumatic experience I just had. How about your grandfather? What's his name? They call him Red. Over the next few months, Sharon underwent regressive hypnosis 20 more times. Frank recorded the details of these sessions and then set out to see if the story of John Gillespie could be documented. In one hypnosis session, Sharon, speaking as John Gillespie, listed the names of nine men serving on the USS Nevada. She also gave John Gillespie's serial number. Frank Baranowski turned to the office of Congressman John Rhodes for help. Well, good morning, Frank. Bob Scanlon, senior aide to the congressman, was assigned the case. Have a chair. Thank you. When he first asked for our help and briefed me on the problem, I was pretty skeptical. I thought, you know, we get a lot of strange requests, and this has to be one of the strangest. I know it's rather incredible, but she gives me names, dates, and places of people. I have no way of checking. Here. When I tapes. heard the story and listened to the tapes, I figured that our office in Washington certainly should be able to get into Naval Archives and either prove or disprove what this young lady had said. Using congressional privileges, Scanlon obtained the Nevada's roster of officers from the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Amazingly, eight of the nine men Sharon mentioned were listed. I remember when I received that and first read it, I told my secretary that I don't know whether to point with pride or view with alarm. This was a, a, a strange result that I really didn't expect. However, the Ensign Tossick, who had played such a prominent part in Sharon's past life memory, was not included on the list. Ensign Tossig was originally shown in all naval records to have been in Long Beach, California the morning of the attack on Pearl Harbor, when in fact he was on board the Nevada and was, was tragically injured that morning. In fact, I think, as we found later, he lost a leg due to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Unsolved Mysteries contacted Robert Tossig, a former ensign in the United States Navy. Tossig declined to be interviewed on camera, but incredibly confirmed many details of Sharon's account. 
He was on board the Nevada that day, and in fact had to have his leg amputated. The name John Gillespie does not appear on any of the ship's rosters. The Navy admits the only records that they carried were the paymaster's records on board that ship. The fires raged incessantly for two days. All of that was destroyed. Fire would also frustrate any attempt to verify the serial number of John Gillespie. In 1973, flames ravaged a naval warehouse in St. Louis, destroying the service records of thousands of seamen from World War II. How about your grandmother? Sharon's past life memory also included information about John Gillespie's personal life. Under hypnosis, she stated that he was born in 1921 in Omaha, Nebraska, the son of John Gillespie Sr. and grandson of Harry Gillespie. In census records from 1899, Frank found what he believes is proof that John Gillespie did exist. When we came across this frame, we found it. Harry Gillespie, wife Ida May. Son, Benjamin, son, John. And that John was John Gillespie's father. And he would have been 24 years old when John was born, exactly the right age. Yes, you can read about Nebraska, you can read about the farmlands, you can read about Omaha and Lincoln and, and all of those places, but unless you have experienced something, then where do you get specific names, specific places? I mean, your history- How valid are Sharon's so-called past life experiences? At least one expert feels that Sharon may have absorbed tales from books or from the power of hypnotic suggestion. Well, the information about Tossic is easily available to anyone who looks for it in a book that tells a story. Um, the events at Pearl Harbor have probably been as written about as any incident in this century. No, she never did any reading about Pearl Harbor. It was one of those things that she just didn't care for. When somebody would mention, she would just shut around and just walk away. He asks leading questions of his subjects. He seems to take control of the regression rather than allowing the person involved to be in control and to volunteer information. In an attempt to refute the critics, both Frank and Sharon agreed to undergo polygraph tests with Glenn Whiteside, a polygraph examiner for 20 years who has been board certified in four states. In my opinion, Sharon and Frank absolutely are not conducting a hoax. They did not get their information out of records, books. They are not uh, using mind conditioning or hypnotic suggestion. They are not perpetrating a hoax in any way. Any place else? Under hypnosis, Sharon revealed that John Gillespie had a Hawaiian girlfriend named Sugar. This composite was made from Sharon's description. John met Sugar while he was stationed at Pearl Harbor. If she exists, Sugar would today be 70 years old. For most of us, the incredible facts of this story seem hard to accept. How could a woman living today have such vivid memories of someone else's life and death at Pearl Harbor 50 years ago? Is there any way to prove the details of Sharon's account beyond a shadow of a doubt? Probably not. But for believers, there is no need to. Next, a killer has returned to torment the family of the man he murdered. Littleton, Colorado is an affluent suburb 15 miles from Denver. Its residents are, for the most part, business and professional people. Roger Dean was typical. He and his wife, DJ, had lived in Littleton for 15 years. November 21st, 1985 seemed like an ordinary Wednesday morning, except for the car nobody recognized parked outside the Dean home. Some remembered it as a 68 Pontiac, Others is a 76 Oldsmobile, but all agreed on one thing. 
They had never before seen the lone man who sat inside. At the time, they thought nothing of it. But at the time, Roger Dean was still alive. DJ, come out here. At approximately 7 a.m., Roger Dean called his wife, DJ, into the bedroom. DJ, come out here. What is it, Roger? All right, lady, shut, shut up and get on the bed. Oh! Shut up Roger. and get on the bed. Shut oh. up! Oh. Yeah. Tie your hands. The masked intruder forced Roger to tie and blindfold DJ. Then he took Roger into another room. As DJ lay bound helplessly on her bed, she could hear Roger and the gunman talking, but she could not tell what they were saying. You had enough time to think about it? How much money have you got in your savings account? I don't know. How much money have you got in your savings account? I don't know. DJ heard the gunman rifling through drawers. Then a loud noise made him bolt from the room. I don't owe you any money. How much money do you have in your account? I have thirty thousand dollars. Right, I want it, and I want it now. It's not here. All right, we're going to the bank. Let's go. All right, I'll give you the. Go! Suddenly, the gunman fired. The bullet ricocheted, striking Roger Dean in the arm. At the front door, he fired again, five times at point-blank range. Roger Dean died before paramedics could be summoned. After I started hearing the gunshots, I made my way down the steps, and I did get outside. And. From there, things are a little blur. I, I think someone that was driving by must have come by and taken uh, my blindfold off. I'm really not even sure of that. I just uh, knew that Raj, I saw Raj went over to him and he was lying in the street. And then uh, he was taken away and I was taken to the neighbors. From the start, authorities were struck by several oddities in the case. Roger had twine fiber embedded in only one wrist. It appeared that Roger had never actually been tied up by the gunman. Also, Roger was wearing contact lenses when he was shot. Look at these glasses here. Yet strangely, in an upstairs bedroom, his eyeglasses were found covered with duct tape. Police began to theorize that the twine and the glasses were both red herrings planted to give the impression that Roger had been blindfolded and bound. Whoever wore them, sure. We believe that Roger hired an individual to come over to basically kidnap him, uh, take him to his bank, withdraw $30,000 from their account, and then obviously drop Roger off someplace so Roger could report a robbery and he would have that $30,000 to himself. During the investigation, two other unusual facts emerged. In the year prior to his death, Roger Dean had taken nearly $30,000 from his business and deposited the money in a private account unbeknownst to his wife. Also, on the day of his murder, Roger was seen sipping coffee in his garage at 7 a.m. On most weekdays, Roger left the house no later than 6.15. What we make of that timing is that he was waiting for this individual to come and meet him at his house. We also believe that the individual was probably sitting in his car when Roger lifted the garage door, which was a signal for this individual to get out of his car and walk over to uh, Roger's home. This is the man that I was married to for 26 years, and uh, yes, there had been personal problems in the last few years, uh, especially since the death of our son. But I knew the man too well. In my heart, I cannot believe that Roger had anything to do with this. Tragedy was not new to DJ Dean. Two years earlier, her son had been killed in an automobile accident. Within a few months, another accident took the lives of her parents. DJ and her daughter Tammy tried desperately to rebuild their lives. 
Then five years after Roger Dean's murder, DJ received a chilling anonymous letter. Its author claimed to be the man who had killed her husband. The letter arrived on July 21st, 1990. It demanded $100,000. If Roger's murderer did not get the money, he planned to kill again. Do you know that I've met your daughter, Tammy, on a few occasions? She is a very attractive blonde and a very good model. Do not make me kill her. Your son is dead. Your husband is dead. Do not risk your daughter. She is the last one left. I was in total shock. I mean, this was like something that doesn't happen to you. This only happens in the movies. It makes me angry that we had just started to get on with our lives and put the past in the past, and it's all brought up to you again. You know, this person isn't letting us continue, and we never did anything to deserve this. DJ and Tammy notified the local authorities and the FBI. The FBI had no doubt that the extortionist was who he claimed to be, Roger Dean's killer. DJ and Tammy were given round-the-clock protection. The killer had told DJ that he would telephone her on July 27, 1990. FBI agents moved into DJ's home and set up a wiretap operation. Wait for the second ring now. Okay, DJ, pick it up. Hello. Listen, your husband owed me money, and I want my money. If my husband owed you money, I'll pay you what he owed you. I want my money. I'll give it to you. The FBI traced the call to a phone booth in Denver. All right, I'll call you tomorrow, and I'll tell you where to take it. Seven years. But before they could get there, the killer had disappeared. I don't believe my husband owed anyone this money, but that was what he said. And the phone calls continued and continued and continued. After nearly a dozen phone calls, the extortionist told DJ to drive to a supermarket 20 miles north of her home and wait for further instructions. OK, DJ, be calm. With an FBI agent hidden in her car and surveillance trucks and a SWAT team for backup, DJ attempted to lure the killer into a trap. OK, she's out of the car. She's headed across the parking lot now. She's headed towards the uh, phone booth. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited. Could not believe I was really having to go through this terror. And then finally, when I did get Hello. a call, yes. I was given instructions as to which streets to take, and where to make the drop. The extortionist told DJ to leave $100,000 in an alley behind an apartment complex in downtown Denver. At 10 p.m. on August 19, 1990, DJ left the money, once again shadowed by the FBI. followed instructions, and now I'm going to hurt you. He called about, it seemed like forever, but a couple of hours later, and was using a lot of profanity and said that she had basically not followed his instructions, had not done what he had told her to do, and that now he was going to um, do what he had said that he would do to me. Because of that, he would hurt me. The FBI kept the bundle of cash under surveillance until dawn. It was never picked up. Whether or not he spotted something, whether or not he just took for granted that the law enforcement was involved, or whether or not uh, he got cold feet, and although he didn't detect any type of law enforcement, he just was too scared to actually make the pickup. I think all those are possibilities. When he didn't pick it up, I was devastated because I thought, this is not over. 
I was totally devastated. There's nothing more that either one of us want than for this to be solved and for whoever murdered my dad to be caught. And at the same time, for him to be also caught for the fact that he's still terrorizing us. He is still making us live a nightmare that continues on and on all the time. In his last call, the extortionist told Tammy he still planned to kill her and that he would strike when she least expected it. Authorities know only that the suspect is about six feet tall and uses an extensive vocabulary. Interestingly, they feel that the extortion letters were written by a man and a woman working in conjunction. past four years, 68 wanted fugitives profiled on unsolved mysteries have been captured, thanks to vital information provided by you, our viewers. One recent case was that of a convicted con man wanted by Nevada police for murder. Joe, come on out, Joe. On October 6, 1990, Henderson, Nevada police entered the home of 50-year-old Joe Weldon Smith. Inside the house, they found the bodies of Smith's wife, Judith, and his two stepdaughters. All three victims had been strangled and bludgeoned to death. Hello? Two hours after the bodies were discovered, Joe Smith telephoned his wife's daughter-in-law. He denied any involvement in the murders. Joe, what's going on? It's she called her on the phone, told her that he had killed one of the people that did the killing and knew who the other ones were. I'm going to find the guys who did it. I know who they are, and I'm going to kill them. In my opinion, it was a ruse by Mr. Smith to get support from Judah Smith's family members and make them believe that he was not involved in the killings. Joe Weldon Smith was charged with three counts of first-degree murder. His whereabouts remained a mystery until the night of our broadcast. Just minutes after we profiled Smith's case, an anonymous viewer called our telecenter to report that the fugitive was living near Los Angeles, California. Smith was hiding out at this motel, but managed to escape before he could be apprehended. Once we established that Joe Willen Smith was in the Los Angeles area, we focused our attention to his brother, who we knew that he had close contact with. After five days of surveilling this brother, uh, we established where the suspect was residing. 20 minutes later, Joe Weldon Smith was arrested at another local motel where he was registered under an assumed name. Inside Smith's room, detectives recovered several credit and identification cards. Smith told police that he was in the process of creating a new identity. At the time of his arrest, Joe Smith indicated to me that he had seen the last airing of the Unsolved Mystery Program. He also told me that it was very tough being a fugitive, and he always knew that you know, someone would be knocking at the door one day. He was kind of glad it's all over at this point. Next, a beautiful young con artist embarks on a wild shopping spree. Las Vegas, Nevada, the city of light in the desert, a seductive town of high rollers and big spenders where money flows quickly and easily. On the weekend shortly before Christmas 1990, an eccentric young woman named Liza Montgomery began a bizarre and most unusual shopping spree, remarkable even in freewheeling Las Vegas. On Friday afternoon, December 21st, Liza, dressed to the nines, visited local businessman Mark Hughesby. She was responding to his newspaper ad, offering to sell a full-length mink coat and a two-carat diamond ring. Hello, Mark. Hi, Liza. How are, how are you? you? Come on in. Oh, thank you. Liza's personality was like uh, that of a 
excited schoolgirl. Here is your cashier's check. Oh my God, there it is. And there's the ring. Well, Lisa, oh, I told you to bring cash. Gosh. I know, but the bank was closing. And uh, anyway, that's just as good. I mean, don't worry about it. I and mean, it's a good check. Well, oh. can I see your ID, please? Oh, sure. I asked to see her identification because I had told her when she came to the home here that I did want cash, but uh, I settled for the cashier's check. Thank you. Well, let me walk you to the car. Oh, all right. Thank you. As I was saying goodbye to, to, to Liza uh, and I walked her out to her car, uh, it seemed very unusual to me that she, how she treated the mink coat. Uh, she just uh, literally shoved it in the car as if it meant nothing to her. Have a nice Christmas. You too. Liza's shopping marathon was just beginning. Oh, hello. That same evening, she purchased two rings which she had selected the previous week. She paid with a cashier's check in excess of $39,000. And here are your rings. Oh, thank you. They're just beautiful. Liza had been coming to us for about three months. She was always well dressed, so we had never had a problem believing whether or not she could actually afford anything she wanted to. That's good. You know, you're very fortunate to get both of these diamonds at this price. Well, that's why they call me lucky. Here's your cashier's check. Oh, great. This looks fine. Uh, the next day, Liza continued her rounds, clad in the mink coat she had bought from Mark Hughesby and driving an old, battered moving van. Honey, if you could just write down that number. She purchased what she called a surprise gift for her husband, $23,000 worth of furniture. Throughout the weekend, Liza continued her seemingly endless Christmas shopping, always paying with cashier's checks. At nine different stores, she picked up an additional $100,000 worth of jewelry, furs, and luxury items. All along the way, Liza made a big impression and raised quite a few eyebrows. People were becoming suspicious, starting with businessman Mark Cusby. Shortly after selling Liza the mink coat and ring, Hughesby began to question whether Liza's check was good. He drove to an exclusive gated community, looking for the address printed on Liza's identification card. Hi, do you have a Liza Montgomery living here at 2901 Rancho Billard Drive? No, sir. Are you sure? I'm positive that address doesn't even exist. Hughesby immediately returned home and called the police. I explained to him that unless or until the bank received that check and officially notified him that it was counterfeit or somehow forged, there was really nothing we could do at that point. Even if we were able to find her, we'd have no authority to detain her simply because the address on a cashier's check was somehow an error and that we couldn't detain her just based on that. Be careful with that. Meanwhile, back at the furniture store, Liza was having difficulty squeezing everything she had bought into the van. It's all gonna fit. If you want to, you can borrow one of our trucks and we can follow you over there. No, thank you. Are you sure? I mean, after you surprise your husband, I'd be glad to help you set up some of the furniture. I don't care what you have to do. Just get it in there. Just, just get it in. Okay. The store owner was troubled by her belligerent attitude. Once the van was loaded, he decided to follow in his own car just to see where Liza would go. Before leaving, the amateur sleuth gave his wife a walkie-talkie and took one for himself. She's turning away from Rancho Bel Air. I knew she was lying. I call the police, so I'm gonna keep following her. Okay. We learned from dispatch that the check had already been passed at the furniture store and that it was in the name of Liza Montgomery, which was the exact same name that Mark Usby had given us. Uh, based on that information, we felt that there was enough corroboration now, since there were two checks floating around, that uh, she needed to at least be stopped and identified. Got the sounds of it only about 10 minutes away, maybe? Six if we hurry. The furniture store owner followed Liza's van to a residential neighborhood five miles away. He described each event as it unfolded. She just pulled over onto a residential street and met up with a man standing next to a red convertible. Now, he's getting into the truck. She's getting into the car. They're leaving together and heading north on Jones. OK. My husband says that the woman made contact with the man. The store owner's wife vehicle. attempted to keep authorities abreast of her husband's Would you whereabouts. the store owner to uh, try and keep up with the vehicle if he can. And uh, we'll be there uh, momentarily, within two or three minutes. 
The van and the red convertible headed south. The store owner remained on their heels. When the vehicles reached an intersection on the outskirts of town, the van made an illegal right turn and sped away. She stopped her car. Well, I better get out of here. The store owner was fearful that this angry woman in a white mink coat might be carrying a weapon. He sped off with a convertible in hot pursuit. After nearly a three-mile chase, the store owner pulled to the side of the road. Liza whizzed by and disappeared. The police were just minutes away, but it was too late. They combed a five-mile area searching for Liza and her accomplice. They ran checks on various garages and warehouses, hoping to recover the stolen goods. But the perpetrators and the property were gone. In summary, she hit at least 12 places that we're aware of. And uh, the amount of loss to all of those in, um, in total was over $150,000. The last of the places she hit uh, was a gaming supply store at which time she bought three slot machines, almost as if she wanted to take a souvenir of Las Vegas with her out of town. Eventually, the van and the convertible were recovered. Liza had rented both vehicles at local agencies. In each case, she persuaded the rental clerk to accept a $500 cash deposit in lieu of a credit card. The cash was never reclaimed. Usually, we only find this type of skill amongst people who are going to uh, get involved in a scam that's worth thousands upon thousands of dollars. For the most part, uh, some of these uh, nickel and dime um, uh, con games fall through when the victim looks straight through the suspect and is able to see that it is a con game. But when we talk about big money like this, if they're going to get away with it, they're going to have to be very good. And Liza was one of the best. Liza Montgomery did leave behind one significant piece of evidence. When she rented the van, the clerk made this copy of her state ID card. When we return, an intriguing eyewitness account may help solve a string of bizarre disappearances. February 4th, 1990, 4.30 a.m. Sheriff's deputies responded to a call at a convenience store in Orlando, Florida. Who here called Sheriff's Office? Two customers had found the all-night yeah. market open, but curiously unattended. No one was minding the store. And uh, a friend of mine works here, and I stopped in to say hello, and she wasn't here. I don't know where she is. She just kind of disappeared. Deputies immediately searched for any signs of the missing clerk. Behind the counter, they found a work smock neatly folded. The cash register was locked, and there was no evidence of a robbery. The store appeared to be just abandoned. There was absolutely no signs of any struggle. Nothing appeared to be missing from the store, with the exception of the store clerk. The missing clerk was 26-year-old Deborah Deanne Poe, who worked days at a local newspaper and nights at the store. Deborah had moved to Orlando just four months earlier with her friend and roommate, Lori Tillman. Debbie and I were more like sisters than I am with my own sister. We had a very unusual friendship. We could fight like sisters do. We could ignore each other like sisters do. But we were there for each other. If we ever needed anything, we could count on one another. Good evening, sir. That's the dollar The most dangerous time for convenience store employees is the graveyard shift. Joe, how you this doing was tonight? Deborah's shift. Five nights a week from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., she was behind the counter alone. How are you all doing? Treating the ladies nice on a Saturday night? 
There you go. She needed Have to work and get the money. She had a brand new car to pay for. She wanted to buy a house, and she wanted to start a business. So if it meant working two full-time jobs that she really didn't like, that's what she'd do. Just after 11 o'clock on the night she disappeared, a friend of Deborah's dropped by to discuss some house plans that's with her. What I want. This house here? It's cool. That's what I want. Now, I don't know if I can afford it. Police verified that Deborah waited on customers from the time her friend left until 3.05 a.m. I gotta take care of her, I'm sorry. Okay. When her friend returned at 3.50 a.m., Deborah was nowhere to be found. Her vehicle was parked where she parked it that night when she came to work. It had not been disturbed, it was uh, locked, and her purse was uh, sitting on the back seat. Investigators concluded that Deborah Poe had probably been abducted. Looks to be about $25 cash in here. They soon discovered that Deborah was not the first store clerk in Florida to disappear on the graveyard shift. Six months earlier, on August 6, 1989, 29-year-old Donna Callahan disappeared from a convenience store in Gulf Breeze, Florida. As in Deborah's case, there were no signs of struggle at the scene. Donna was three months pregnant and left behind a two-year-old daughter. Five weeks later, on September 18th, 36-year-old Darlene Messer was abducted from a Lake City convenience store. Two days later, Darlene's body was found in a nearby creek. She had been bludgeoned to death. Three victims, all single females in their 20s or 30s, all had vanished while working the graveyard shift alone. Investigators believed that the cases were linked, but had no suspect. Then three days after Deborah Poe's disappearance, authorities were contacted by a young woman who read about the case in a local paper. She came forward after realizing that she may have stood face to face with Deborah Poe's abductor. I stopped by a convenience Hi. store about 3.30 to pick up a pack of cigarettes, and there was only one person in the store, and it appeared to be the clerk. Looking back on it, he didn't know where the cigarettes were, which isn't that uncommon if it's a new clerk. And I had to point out which ones I wanted. No, the regular ones up top over there. He had long, stringy hair. He was wearing an earring of a cross. You really some smoking. And a skull's ring. Yeah, right. And he had a rock T-shirt and the name Megadeth across the top. We cannot locate anyone else that has um, been able to uh, tell us whether or not this individual was in the store when they were in the store. He might have been a customer that walked in and was walking around looking for the clerk. He might have been an individual who was uh, taking an opportunity to, to shoplift or steal some things. Or he might be responsible, or in part responsible, for the abduction of Deborah Pope. There's a a good possibility that we're de dealing with uh, an individual who is a, a serial type of person who abducts these people. Deborah Poe is officially listed as missing. She is 26 years old, five feet two inches tall, and weighs approximately 105 pounds. If we don't find her alive, then we can at least put her to rest, give her, give her a decent service, go after her killer. Join me next time for an all-new edition of Unsolved Mysteries.